So welcome and introductions. Uh, again, my name is Jerry Thomas, and I'm just going to go over a little bit of what is AIEA and sort of the information that we have. Um, so um, basically, AIEA is a 501c3 nonprofit here in Arizona. Uh, it was established after Arizona educators who wanted to better serve their uh, Native American students through collaborative efforts met and created this statewide organization. Um, you know, a lot of our officers, um, they're from the Arizona area and also the Tucson area. Um, so in doing the, so, uh, the mission for us is to develop strategies and activities uh, and also provide research and resources to Arizona schools for the American Indian students to academically excel through culturally responsive education. And then also, uh, we do continue to provide a network of uh, among Indian educators and programs that span from pre-K all the way to higher education. And then we want to continue to deliver our education services uh, by Indian education agencies through, collabor through collaboration, whether it's you know the federal or state or tribal programs level. And then we also continue to organize our um, statewide uh, events and programs for students, such as our scholarship and then our summer youth program. And then finally, we also provide professional development activities for educators and other stakeholders. And then uh, we do have a web page that's under the Intertribal Council's website. Uh, under the Programs tab, it's labeled under the Arizona Indian Education Association, and it's the first program that's listed. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, the YouTube channel was started after we started these webinars back on the last week of April, where we covered tribal scholarships. We also covered TCU's Part 1 and Part 2 of tribal colleges and universities. And now is our fourth episode that we're uh, debuting, which is the uh, Native American tuition waivers. So uh, that's for later on for everyone who wants to go back and look at our previous videos. You can watch it and share it with anyone. And then also we have a Facebook uh, account that is active and we post regularly regarding current issues in Indian education and then legislative updates and then AIEA event updates. And uh, so the purpose of making these education webinars is to introduce topics uh, related to Indian education, you know, for students, uh, parents or caring adults and educators to learn about uh, opportunities they may not know about already. And uh, Right now, our webinar series focuses on um, college planning. So for new and future college students, you know, who wanna know more about the college planning process. Um, we do this by introducing uh, programs, colleges and universities, scholarships, and then inviting their uh, school's representatives in this online layout so that they can hear from multiple professionals and then gain important information on how to start their uh, post high school journey of looking into or applying to colleges, you know, especially during this time of social distancing. Uh, so we put it on this online platform for everyone to access. And then now I'm going to uh, let our uh, president of AIEA, Kimberly Dinkal Begay, uh, give us an overview of AIEA's legislative efforts. Uh, hi, Kimberly. Yep. To just here. All right. Uh Um Kimberly Dankopige Arkan. Um good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Dankopige, as Jerry mentioned, and I I currently serve as the president for the Arizona Indian Education Association. Um as you mentioned in our during our general meeting legislative efforts updates and including those updates these are a few of the issues that we um, discussed during our meetings um, one of the issues about at a local concerns the house bill 2120 in the house uh, during this year's legislative sessions um, this bill specifically was in regard to the cultural regalia for graduation ceremonies um, this House bill introduced was introduced to amend current policies for graduation dress code in the state of Arizona. This bill would have gone into effect immediately, allowing current graduates to wear their cultural regalia, including the eagle feathers and 
and eagle plumes. But due to the pandemic, Congress adjourned without, leave, without taking a vote. As Native educators in Arizona, we are still taking on this challenge this year and hope that one day our Native students will walk the stage with pride and honor, wearing their full regalia. The second issues we talked about is the budget decrease by our governor, Doug Ducey. Um, this was concerning his, propose, his pro proposed budget for this year. Um, the operation specifically for the operation of Indian education programs. Um, this includes elementary and secondary um, schools, as well as scholarships for higher education. Um, this, this was decreased by $67,418 overall. This significantly decreased funding for Indian education throughout the state of Arizona. The Office of Indian Education has never been funded, although it is a department under the state of Arizona, it has never been funded by the state of Arizona. So this is another challenge we continue to pursue for the benefit of our Native children and students. Next slide. We also discuss issues um, concerning Native communities on a national level. Um, again, this is just to ensure that our membership and those who attend are, are well aware of the issues surrounding um, the Native American community that have a direct effect upon us since we work directly with families and the children. One of the federal issues that we um, U.S. Department of Education Bureau of Education Tribal Listening session um state of arizona so this is the reason why this issue is being discussed um just to give you a little bit of a background of what this is um on march 20 2020 the president signed the cares act into law in response to the coronavirus emergency with 30.75 billion dollar patient stabilization fund out of this five percent was set aside for the bi uh, bureau of education, which was $153 million. The purpose of this listening session was to hear feedback from tribal leaders, um, the Native education community, and stakeholders regarding funding on four different topics. Um, number one was the needs of schools and students. Two was the current physical, mental, and uh, physical and mental health needs of the students um, at these BIE schools due to the virus. Number three was best these uh, for priority prioritizing the CARES Act, um, including internet connectivity, support distance learning, education technology, and teacher and school leader salaries. The fourth item, um, or the fourth topic of discussion was the how the allocation of this CARES Act fund was to be um, dispersed. Whether it was to solely to go towards K-12 through BIE funded schools or to split TCUs and K-12 through BIE funded schools. This discussion tribal leaders to voice dire concerns, their dire concerns for their communities and provided suggested solutions to the Department of Interior. Um, the next issue discussed, um, um, this is just an example of legal um, cases we talk about during our um, Again, the, because it will directly affect our community, whether it's our own tribal community or those that we work with. Um, this particular case was the voice versus is a Montana voting rights case, um, which was filed in the 13th Judicial District Court in Yellowstone County of Montana. Um, the Ballot Interference Prevention Act, which is otherwise known as BIPA, was a law that imposed severe restrictions to Native American voters, particularly those living on rural reservations. On March 20th, the Native American Rights Fund, American Civil Liberties, Liberty Union and the ACLU of Montana filed a lawsuit challenging this law on behalf of the tribes uh, in the area, as, as well as Native American organizations focused on getting vote and increasing civic participation in the Native American community. The court recently issued a temporary restraining order blocking this law pending the outcome of a hearing, which is actually uh, because their primaries are being held on June 2nd. These ballot collection efforts are often the only way Native Americans living on rural reservations can access the vote. The balance is critical. People on reservations can exercise their fundamental to vote. This case ensure every eligible 
who wants to vote can actually do so and to ensure that more indigenous voters on rural reservations are able to participate in our democracy. Uh, because this is brought up and discussed is because we do have several uh, um, rural areas of Arizona that effectively direct um, how their vote is counted or not counted. And so these are just some examples of the different issues that we discuss at our general meetings. Um, again, if you would like to participate and be a part of our association, I encourage you, which Jerry will talk about our membership drive soon. So thank you. Okay, next, Kim will also cover the what is a tuition waiver definition. Out for today. The definition. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, um, the definition is when you fill out the free for federal student aid, otherwise known as FAFSA, your knowledge of your choice, a snapshot of your family's current financial situation. This enables you to develop a plan for your financial. That package may contain aid from one or more sources. <clears throat> Government, which grants work study program or student loan. Uh, number two, through the institution you wish to attend through scholarships and tuition waivers. Number three, tribal nonprofit and private organizations scholarship. Your institution may offer you scholarship, tuition waiver, or both. There is a continuous long time stereotype that Native American students go to college for free. Although there are many institutions that offer a significant financial aid package, the reason why it is false. There is a difference between a scholarship and a tuition waiver. A scholarship is usually free that doesn't have to be paid back and is used to pay various college expenses. It can be awarded to you by the school you plan to attend or by various tribal organizations. A scholarship above average rich grade a tuition granted by your chosen school and reduces the amount the college charges. The waiver will eliminate the cost of a tuition for a designated hours. It cannot be used for other educational expense. Different types of waivers are out there that um, you may apply for or that you may qualify for. While there may be many reasons a school might grant a waiver, here are some of the most common. Um, it could be due, due to your family, which demonstrates a high uh, because of Native American descent, become a hardship, um, significant hardship, or you are a foster child by diversity or inclusion, and military waiver. Possible that you Use a scholarship and a waiver simultaneously. Each college has its own policy regarding who meets the qualifications for one or the other. We encourage you to call, call your institute aid office to see to qualify for any scholarships and waivers they may offer. For the purposes of this webinar, we are going to focus on why um, on the Native American, American tuition. Thank you, Kim. So next, we're going to hand it over to our representatives from Dartmouth College, but first Fort Lewis College, and they're going to be covering the following information for their institution. So first, we have Alexa from Fort Lewis College. Um, Alexa, whenever you're ready. Alexa, whenever you're ready. Alexa, I think uh, we can't hear you. Maybe the computer is muted. But on WebEx, you're not muted.
If you have earphones, that may be helpful. Okay, um, um, since Alexa um, oh, is experiencing uh, some um, audio uh, issues, we're going to uh, go forward and start with the Dartmouth College presentation. And then when, and then when we're able to, Alexa will go back and cover her for Lewis information. Um, so first, let me go forward to sorry we're gonna go forward can you guys hear me okay yes Let me see. sorry Okay, Steve, whenever you're ready. Great, okay. Well, thanks um, everyone very much uh, to everyone for setting this up and for taking time out of a Friday afternoon to come out and learn a little bit more about this. It's a real honor to be here. Um, my name is Stephen Abbott. I serve as the Associate Director of Admissions for Dartmouth College. I oversee all of our Indigenous Outreach programs. I'm also one of the representatives for, for the state of Arizona. I used to live right next um, do spend a lot of time in Arizona visiting different communities and schools. Um, and I have an additional responsibility uh, here at Dartmouth in that I'm the live-in advisor for our Native American house as well. So I do get the chance to work with our Native Nation end and the admissions end, um, as well as once they're here as, as students. So um, if we can move on to the next slide, we'll start telling you a little bit more about Dartmouth. Great. So um, one of the things uh, about uh, Dartmouth is, uh, and actually I think you'll hear this about Fort Lewis as well, is both of these institutions really have a profound sense of play. Place. So it uh, was founded back in 1769, um, and I'll share a little bit more about the original mission of the college. It's especially important to today's conversation, but we are located uh, right on the Connecticut River between uh, New Hampshire and Vermont. So bit of an aerial view of our camp. Historic unceded Abenaki territory. So those are the people that we look to as the traditional caretakers of this land, the Abenaki folks um, in, there's a community in Vermont as well as just north of us in Canada. So those are the um, elders of this area and the uh, traditional caretakers of our. 
We can go to the next slide. So uh, as you can see, we are located almost uh, equidistant Montreal and Boston. So most of our students uh, who are coming from far enough away to fly will usually fly into Boston. Uh, we do have a bus service that goes uh, seven or eight day uh, direct from campus to all four terminals at uh, Boston Airport as well as to the bus station. So the really nice buses, Wi-Fi, air conditioning, movies, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's a really nice way to arrive on campus. So it is fairly accessible for people to get here. Uh, we are located in a really beautiful rural area, which plays a big part in the identity of the college. So we are arguably the, um, not only the smallest of the eight Ivy League schools, but also the most rural as well. So um, our outing outdoors club is uh, the largest and oldest outdoors club of any college or university in the country. I don't know who figures these things out or how, but somebody did. Um, and students really do get the chance to take advantage of the outdoors in all four seasons. Uh, we are definitely a Four Seasons campus, so um, there is amazing opportunities to go hiking and camping and stuff, uh, trails literally that lead right off campus. The, as I mentioned, we're on the Connecticut River, so we do have a boathouse down by the wall where st uh, students can go canoeing, kayaking, paddle boarding, all that kind of thing. Uh, advantage of uh, the outdoors here. So we can uh, move on to the next slide. So as I mentioned, the school was founded back in 1769 and the original mission of the college is fairly unique among the eight Ivy League schools. It actually founded originally as a native institution. So Eliezer Wheelock and, and some Occam, uh, Eliezer Wheelock was a teacher uh, here in uh, New England, and the Reverend Occam was a Mohegan tribal member who had actually been a student of Wheelock's, and they felt that there was a need for a higher education option uh, in New England for uh, Native American students. So the college was chartered originally with that purpose, um, and then promptly forgot about it for uh, the first 200 years of Dartmouth's history are not, um, not particularly impressive. And it was actually a small group of students in collaboration with our college president, John Kemeny, back in 1970, that really worked to reaffirm the institution's commitment um, to that original charter and to that mission. So since that time, when the program was really reborn, um, Dartmouth has been one of the premier institutions among the highly selective colleges and serving uh, Native American students. So uh, we can move on to the next. So where we stand uh, right now um, is, as I mentioned, we are the smallest of the eight Ivy League schools. We're 4,200 students. So we fall into about a sort of a mid-size uh, institution overall. And we do have a very, very strong uh, undergraduate focus. You'll notice that we are Dartmouth College, not Dartmouth University, um, despite the fact that we do have several excellent graduate programs on campus. The undergraduate institution. So all the faculty who teach at the college teach only at the college. And uh, so as an undergraduate student, one of the really nice uh, competing with graduate students, others for faculty time and attention. So all of our classes are actually taught by uh, full faculty members and not taught by grad students or assistants or anything like that. Uh, we are generally ranked in the top five every year for uh, commitment to undergraduate teaching. Um, and we are a liberal arts institution too, so the focus of Dartmouth really is very much on that idea of educating the whole person uh, as much as possible. And so when you enter Dartmouth, you don't, you're not admitted to any particular program. You're not admitted to pre-med, you're not admitted to engineering or nursing or anything like that. You enter Dartmouth College and you have that first full year to explore, take different types of classes, see what you think you might be interested in. We find that at least 50, um, more like 75% of our students change their major or change their minds about their major at least once uh, during their time here. So we wanna make sure that they have the flexibility uh, in order to do that. So generally it's during the sophomore year, the second year the students will pick their major. And when they do that, they'll have the option to pick from the 50 different programs that we have available. Um, but a lot of our students, in fact, almost half of our students will ultimately end up creating their own major or their own minor 
by taking two or more different subjects uh, and blending those together. So it's very popular, particularly with our native studies program for a lot of our native and indigenous students to take things like whatever it might be, government or environmental science, econ, uh, and then modify it with our native studies program so that they can actually study, incorporate more of an indigenous focus in doing so. So we can go on to the next. Great. So um, you can see we offer over 200, uh, over 2,000 classes off every year. Uh, degrees offered in 50 different disciplines. Like I said, it's a seven to one student faculty ratio. And uh, said yesterday, we're required to say that it's 99.9% .9 of our classes are taught by the faculty in that we do actually have one of those 2,100 classes that is taught by a graduate student. Uh, it's an upper level math class. So um, the other 2,009 are all taught by the by the faculty. So very small class sizes here, very hands on, very active, interactive kind of. So um, nearly two thirds of our classes are going to be 20 students or smaller, and that's from the moment you walk in the door. Uh, we have very, very classes in the entire curriculum that enroll more than 100 students. Um, so you're going to get to know your faculty very well, get to know peers very well. Uh, it's very much an interactive community. The next slide, please. So flexibility, very much the name of the game here um, in terms of not only what you choose to study, which is obviously wide open to you, the opportunities you have to change even after you declare a major in your sophomore year, you still have the opportunity to change that quite literally until the time you graduate. So I actually worked with two seniors last year who changed their major in spring of senior year. Uh, it's not a course that I usually recommend, but um, those students were able to do it. Um, how you choose to study it, and then also setting up your own academic calendar. So Dartmouth has a little bit of a unique setup um, in terms of our semesters. So most colleges and universities will have a fall semester, a spring semester, all year round. So we have four different quarters that just match the seasons, fall, winter, spring, and summer. And uh, the good news is students are not taking classes. This is all four of those quarters. They're only going to take quarters per year. But the even cooler thing is that you actually get to decide which of the four quarters you're going to take off. So if you'd like to take your classes during the summertime, you can take the fall or the winter or the spring off instead, uh, which really offers a huge amount of flexibility. It's been great for a lot of our students uh, who have like ceremonial or specific responsibilities back home at certain times of the year. They can build their academic program around that. Um, or if you get the opportunity to do an internship or something off campus, you can build that in pretty much any time during the year, not just during having to wait for your summer breaks. So that doesn't have to be the same plan, the same calendar every year, and you don't have to know what that looks like coming in. Again, that's another thing that you'll build as you um, go for. I want to mention in the photo here, um, Poli Sierra Long that you see there um, with our organic farm. She's one of our students who's actually getting ready to graduate in about two weeks. Uh, she's from Arizona and um, she's working there with the organic farm, but this was an amazing uh, project that she took on. She was gifted some ancestral seeds a number of years ago and the seeds were roughly 800 years old. They were preserved in a seed pot and that was how well that seed pot technology worked. Get the seeds and grow a species of squash that actually hadn't been seen in North America in over 400 years really a, an amazing thing. So Poli actually started our indigenous agriculture group, which was one of our um, student organizations here on campus as well. So we are going to miss her when she graduates in a couple weeks. Next slide. So one of the other of the Dartmouth plan that's really exciting is the opportunity abroad. So students are not required to study abroad if they don't want to, but almost uh, well over half of our students about percent uh, do study abroad at least once. So we have 60 different standing programs uh, that students can take advantage of, and they are literally all over the world. Some of them are language immersion programs. Some of them are uh, just other disciplines where you're actually taking your courses in English, but just in a different country. And students can actually do as many different study abroad programs. So about 60% study abroad at least once, about 30% are studying abroad two or more times. So it's really a tremendous opportunity to get out there and engage a, a really global education. And we do have a couple of off-campus study programs that are actually based here in the US um, as well, including one through our Native Studies program 
which is actually a partnership with the Institute of American Indian Arts down in Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico. So that one's offered in the fall um, and a focus on both uh, native arts as well as tribal uh, with that uh, with that program. So um, next slide. Oh, and I should mention the, um, one of the greatest things about our study abroad programs too is that there's no additional cost for the study abroads. Um, so you're going to pay the same cost, whether you're here in New Hampshire or in India or New Zealand or Peru or wherever you just, um, decide to go and your financial aid will cover uh, study abroad as well. So uh, snapshot the community here, um, despite being a small college, it is a very diverse and rich student population. So we have about a 50 50 split between men and women. Um, we have students from all 50 states. Uh, over 70 different countries internationally, about 10 to 15 percent of our students every year are the first in their family to ever go to college. Uh, about 10 to 12 percent of our students are coming from outside the U.S. 40 percent of our students identify as students of color and around four to five percent of our students every year um, are indigenous students representing over 75 uh, different tribal nations from around the country and. Increasingly around the world. Our students are receiving financial aid. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and we do have about 350 uh, different student organizations for students to get involved with. So very, very active campus. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. And it is uh, very much a resident campus as well. So you never have to worry about finding housing or things like that. Um, housing is guaranteed for students all four years. Um, and it is built right into your cost of attendance. So uh, about 92% um, of our students live on campus all four years. So this is a little bit of an outline of some of the specific uh, native and indigenous resources on campus. As I mentioned, there's about 200 native students here uh, representing really, really diverse cross section, not only of Indian country, but also our native Hawaiian community, Alaska native community, First Nations communities from Canada, um, and increasingly into the South Pacific and other parts of um, the indigenous world out there. Uh, we have about 10 different indigenous student organizations. So everything from an ACES chapter to our uh, powwow planning committee, Dartmouth powwow is almost 50 years old at this point. It's a two day contest powwow that happens on Mother's Day weekend and that's all planned by. By the students, uh, we have a beating circle. Armstrong nimbly working some uh, size 10 or 11 beads there um, and. Um, so all kinds of different things for students to, to get involved with. We have language circles um, and a number of different a number of different outlets for the students. There is a Native American program here that's actually an administrative office that is uh, designed to support our students so tutoring um, and they work with students one on one for academic advising as well as personal and cultural advising. Uh, we have a native pre orientation program so for our incoming first year students um, each year get to arrive a few days early move into their dorms and we spend those three days working with them to help identify different resources around campus that will be of value to them. Uh, we have a, the Native Studies program that I mentioned. Um, it's an amazing program with eight full time faculty. Strongly interdisciplinary program. So in addition to things like history and anthropology, uh, you really find things that are taught from an indigenous perspective. So uh, it's one of the reasons that it has been so attractive for so many of our native students. So everything from environmental science, women's studies, creative writing, law, uh, all different kinds of things are represented within the department for um, opportunities for study. We have the Native American house here on campus, which is where I live. Uh, as I say, I'm the live-in advisor for that. We, this is a residential house, so we do have about 16 students who live here ordinarily when we are not under COVID quarantine. Um, but it is also an uh, open resource to all of our students on campus. So there's a nice big kitchen uh, where students can come in and cook. Uh, we have a fry bread contest every year to uh, see whose grandma's recipe is really the best. Um, and uh, a lot of different community events. Students use it for their meetings, um, events, uh, all kinds of things, as well as study space, you know, all throughout the year. Very active Native alumni group, about 1,200 uh, Native alumni spread all over the world doing really amazing things. Um, the Hood Museum, which is our main museum here on campus, uh, has an actual uh, Native curatorial team that works specifically with our Native collections, which are both historic artifacts as contemporary, a really, really amazing of contemporary art and I think the things that is most intimidating for people thinking about East Coast private um, the kind of education is that there just isn't going to be any support um, and that sort of thing and not only are you going to find the rate for our Native students is over 90 percent so uh, the vast majority of our students do um, do end up finishing their their undergraduate degree uh, with us so 
and move on to the next slide. Okay. So um, couldn't resist our little little Yoda plug there, but uh, I did want to mention, so in the context of today's uh, program, there is actually a very popular rumor out there that Dartmouth has a tuition, an automatic tuition waiver for native students. Um, that is not true. It actually never has been. Um, but a lot of times because of the origins and the history of Dartmouth, that's something that people have assumed, including some of our own alumni. But uh, and it is actually not true. But what we do offer is 100% uh, need based financial aid. So basically our guarantee to any student who is admitted to Dartmouth is if you apply for financial aid, uh, you fill out the financial aid paperwork for us and um, your family pays whatever your expected family contribution is. Um, and Dartmouth pays for the rest of it. And that's automatic. It is not a limited scholarship. It's not just for native students. It's not only for first year. Uh, it's all the year. That you're here and it's for everyone who. Uh, covering tuition, housing. Everything that you need. Um, every penny you're going to have to spend. In so it's really, really an amazing financial aid offer. There's only a few. Um, are able to offer this as well. It's the benefit of having a large endowment and a, a good institutional commitment to. To aid, but we do want to make sure that cost is not. Per student was about fifty six thousand. Program that kicks in and automatically and guarantee that you have no loans in your financial aid package as well. So uh, next slide. And this is actually just going to be a quick word about uh, the admissions process itself. So we do actually use the common application. Uh, it's used by about 500 different schools around the country with a supplement for Dartmouth. We are a little bit different uh, than um, many of our peer institutions in that we do not, there is not a, a point of qualification for, uh, for the college. We do what we call a holistic review. Dartmouth does, for better or for worse, fall into that schools. Uh, which essentially are schools that are able to admit fewer than 50% of the students who apply. And that is not because those students are not qualified or not capable of coming here and doing the work. It means that we have far more people applying for the spaces that we have available. So um, we do what we call a holistic application review. So we are literally looking at everything in your application. So we are looking at your community involvement. We're looking at your personal statement. We're looking at your recommendation. Um, all those different are uh, so it is um, you do not have to be a perfect straight A student to get into Dartmouth so if our students do come in having done very well but um, but it is again about your voice about what you're bringing to campus and really about the whole um, the whole person so you can see on the screen there are the things that are uh, required under the common application fairly standard for most um, most colleges um, we do actually have two different deadlines. We have an early decision option November 1st, and we have a regular decision option on January 2nd. Uh, we do accept transfer students as well. Unfortunately, we only accept a fairly small number of transfer students. It's the downside of having a really um, high retention rate. So um, we only have a few spaces available every year, but the deadline for that is March 1st if people are interested in transfer options. So uh, if we can move to the last slide, uh, last thing I want to mention is for anyone who might be interested, we do have um, our Indigenous fly-in every place in October over Indigenous Peoples Day weekend. Uh, this is an all expense paid program, so we actually pay to bring the students up to campus. Uh, this is for basically those who would be rising seniors uh, this year, so folks who would be applying for college this coming year with the intention of entering in the so we bring about 60 uh, native students to campus. Um, we pick you up at the airport. We pay for your plane ticket. You stay with one of our current students for several days as a host in the dorms. You get to eat in the dining halls, attend actual classes. Um, we do admissions and financial aid workshops with you, really try to give you a taste of what Dartmouth daily life is like. So um, 
that uh, the deadline for that program is coming up on July 6th. And um, we uh, do have the application is right online. Uh, my contact information, I think, is on the next slide if we want to go to that. And uh, it's also in the chat box there. So if anybody would like to reach out to me, please feel free to email is probably the best given our current situation. Um, but uh, please feel free to reach out anytime. And we are anticipating that the fly in will still be on campus this fall, but we are still waiting to hear from the college and from the governor what the state of New Hampshire will be requiring for uh, schools come fall. So we have not made a full announcement yet about the fall term, but we're hoping it will be on um, on campus. If not, we will be doing a virtual program um, instead during the same time period. So um, anyway, that's uh, it for Dartmouth. And thank you very much for listening. And we'll hopefully turn it over to I want to point out this was all went flawlessly yesterday in practice. So um, there's just uh, you can never can tell what it's going to be like on uh, on the premiere night. But. Yeah. Awesome. Can and can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. And Woo! Oh. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. So Jerry's going to get back to my slide. I want to everyone for your patience. Something's going on with my computer. So I have switched to my computer, but let's hop in and get started. So y'all can learn a little bit more about Fort Lewis. Before I get started, I just wanted to start by acknowledging the land that we gather on at Fort Lewis College is the ancestral lands and territories of the Nuchu, Apache, the Pueblos, Hopi, Zuni, and the Diné Nation. We think it's important to provide this acknowledgement because the narratives of this land and region have long told from one dominant perspective without full acknowledgement of the tribes who lived on this land before it was Fort Lewis. Thank you for your attention and respect in acknowledging this important history. So now we're gonna get started. If you go to the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about where Fort Lewis is located. We like to say that we're powered by place because we are located in a very unique location. We're located in Durango, Colorado. Of Colorado, as you can see on that map where that bright yellow star right there, Durango, Colorado, the Four Corners region. So if you're coming from more of northern Arizona, it's going to be anywhere from maybe a two to four hour drive to Durango. If you're coming more from the Valley, Phoenix area, you're looking more at around six hours. Tucson, y'all are a little bit more south, so it's more like nine or ten hours, but trust me, it's worth the drive, I promise. It's not that bad of a drive, or really, I promise you. Um, so we are fairly close, so a little bit later about ways that you can visit our campus, but we always encourage students and educators and parents to come and visit our campus since we are just a few hours away from all of you guys. Now you can see on that picture, that is where we're located. So we are in a small mountain town. So you can see Fort Lewis is surrounded by the mountains. And actually, if you look at that Mesa, that is where our campus is located. So down, that's downtown Durango. And then right on top of that Mesa, that is Fort Lewis College. So we have a very unique location. Our students have their own kind of community and ecosystem going up there on the Mesa, but then they're also very accessible to downtown Durango as well. If you continue to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about our student population. So Fort Lewis, similar to Dartmouth, Fort Lewis is a pretty small college. We're around 3,300 students total. So 3,300 students total, about 47 states are represented. Arizona is in the top three. So it goes Colorado, New Mexico, and then Arizona. So we always get quite a few Arizona students every year because we are so close to you guys. We're about 50% students of color, so a very diverse campus as well. Around 41% of our student population identifies as Native American or Alaska Native, and we have around 177 Native American tribes and Alaska Native presented. So a little bit later, I'm going to talk about those resources that, resources that we offer for our students as well. But overall, we're a very diverse campus. We have students from all over the country that are coming to attend our little community here in Durango, Colorado. So to continue to the next slide, I'm going to kind of talk about what our classrooms look like and our classroom structure. So at Fort Lewis, as I said, we're a fairly small college. So your average class sizes are going to be around 20. And honestly, our professors really like to cap it at that 23 student average class because they want to get to know our students. Um, they want to know when our students are thriving, when they're struggling, when they're in class, when they're not in class. 
but I'm sure all of the students who are listening will be in class. I'm sure you're nodding your head while you're listening and looking at the computer, I'm sure of it. Um, but ultimately, they want to know who you are as a person. They want to know how they can support you. And for the educators who are listening or their parents who are listening, making that transition from living at home, from living with your family to going to ultimately your new home at your new college can be a difficult transition. And so having those smaller class sizes, you're really able to get to know your peers in your class as well. It's not a very overwhelming experience. You're really thriving academically. So again, we keep it at that 16 to 1. So also, about 100% of are taught by our faculty members rather than grad level or teaching assistants. So starting your freshman year, you are going to be taught by the best of the best. Our like to pride themselves on being teachers first and researchers taught by faculty starting your year. Now, to continue to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about the different academic programs we have at Fort Lewis. Now, this slide is the general programs. So, we, as you can see, we have over 50 bachelor's programs, and we also have one master's program in teacher education. We also have a dual program with the University of Denver. Well, everything from our STEM fields, so some of our popular STEM programs are going to be engineering, geology, exercise biology. We also have a pre-vet, pre-med, pre-PT track. So for those of you students who are looking at possibly going to med school, we do have those tracks. So within our programs like Indigenous Studies, which is one of our popular programs, uh, psychology, sociology, if you're looking at just a studies program, so a lot to choose from. We also have a business school as well. So if you're looking at marketing, business management, accounting, we have all of those programs. We have an education program as well. So if you're looking at adventure education, so how you the outside world, how to um, logically uh, recreate, we have an adventure education program. We have early childhood education, secondary education. We have all the way to our master's program as well. So a lot to choose from. I know it looks very overwhelming. We have all of those programs on our website as well if you want to delve a little bit deeper. Now to continue to the next slide, this is just going to talk a little bit about how we educate our students. So what is the Fort Lewis College difference? What makes our college different from the others? And the main part that makes our college different is our experiential learning. So at Fort Lewis, we're firm believers and there's only so much as a student that you classroom and flipping through a book page by page right one are you really going to absorb that information the way you need to and two it can be a little boring as well right it's okay you can nod your heads i can't see you nod your heads but i know you're nodding your heads um so we're firm believers and the best way to learn is to get outside of the classroom these are some of the ways that our students are taking advantage of those experiential learning opportunities every single program there's going to be some type of internship component and because you have class sizes at Fort Lewis College professors are really able to talk with our students see what internships are going to work best for them either you can stay in the Four Corners region you can go outside of the state you can even go go outside of the country for your internships as well but each student is going to have the opportunity to get real life experience while they're still in college as well now we also do a lot of undergrad research at Fort Lewis institution we have that one grad level program in teacher education so what that means is generally with other universities that have maybe a bunch of different graduate level programs um, usually professors time and attention all that state of art technology usually goes to grad level students but at Fort Lewis our undergrads are our shining stars so they're going to be able to use the fancy new equipment state-of-the-art technology they're going to have all of our professors time and energy they're going to be working side by side with our professors starting your freshman that's the key. We start our students with the experience of learning starting your freshman year. So again, there's a ton of ways that you can take advantage of these activities. And lastly, we do, similar to Dartmouth, we do have a great study abroad program as well. And I'm going to chat about our Native American tuition waiver a little bit later. But again, you can apply the Native American tuition waiver to the study abroad programs. We just had one of our student ambassadors who just came back from Granada, Spain. She lived there for an entire year. And she was eligible for the waiver, so she lived in Spain tuition free. 
and all of her financial aid followed to Spain as well. So a lot of really use in terms of the experiential learning aspect at Fort Lewis. So to continue on, we're gonna talk a little bit about admission at Fort Lewis. So our admission, it's a little bit different than Dartmouth's. We usually look at a couple different criteria for admission at Fort Lewis. One, you an application on our website. We have our own application process. So you just go to apply.fortlewis.edu, fairly simple. Our fall 2020 applications are currently open. So for any, anyone who's interested in starting in 2020, you can still apply. For those students who are interested in fall 2021, that application is gonna open on September 1st. We are a rolling admission. So once we get your application, immediately send you an admission decision within two to three weeks. Now, once you apply to Fort Lewis, we look at two different criteria. We're going to look at your high school transcript and this students. We'll look at your high school transcript, so you can either email or mail that to us. And we also look at your ACT or SAT test scores. Now, if you are a current senior or you're looking at coming for fall 2020, you're like, yikes, I wasn't able to take my ACT or SAT because it was canceled. That's okay. For now, we are waiving that requirement. So please still apply and just send us your transcripts as well. Now, for transfer students, we it's similar in terms of when our applications are open, we work really closely with transfer students as well. For transfer students, they just have to send in their official college transcripts as well. And we do some individualized pre-enrollment as well for our transfer students. There's also a $40 application fee. However, for those of you who are attending this webinar, I will actually give you a fee waiver code if you shoot me an email or you can give me a call. All my information is in that chat box and I'm gonna give it to you at the end of this webinar. But if you're interested in applying, go ahead and shoot me an email and I'm happy to give you that fee waiver code. Thank you. Next slide. A little American Center. So at Fort Lewis, as I mentioned, we 41% of our students identify as Native American, Alaska Native, or Indigenous. And so as a non-tribal Native American student, numerous resources for our students. The majority of those resources are going to be housed in our Native American Center. As you our little resources, we academic support. We have free tutoring in any subject at Fort Lewis College. So for any student who is struggling in any specific subject, they can come to the Native American Center and get free tutoring. Also, almost every single professor also houses their own hours, so their own office hours, American Center as well. So you can sit down one-on-one -on -one with your professor and talk through any academics that you need to with your professor. We also have a cultural kitchen um, as well. So it's similar to Dartmouth. There's, you know, we have, there's every, I think it's every other they would have like fry bread Wednesday and trust me it was a ding on my calendar to walk by the Native American Center just to you know see if there was any leftover um, but again it's a really good way for Fort Lewis to make the students feel like it's their home away from home so for the cultural kitchen students are able to use it um, during hours and they get to make all of their homemade goods and just really make it feel like home and share it with other peers as well we also have scholarship opportunities through the Native American so specifically for our students, we have some scholarships on and we also have professional staff that are there 24 seven to help with our students. So if you have any questions or concerns, our professional staff are there to walk you through it as well. Now I'm going to start to talk about a little bit about our activities, programs and student organization. So on the next slide, it's going to talk a little bit about some of our activities and programs that we have at Fort Lewis. So this isn't a list of all of our activities and programs, but some of the main ones. So one of them is going to be our Hajoni Days pageant. So we have one of the largest powwows in the Four Corners area. We have community members from all over the region that come to Fort Lewis College. And we have a, a huge pageant for three days. Unfortunately, this year it was canceled. However, next year it's going to be bigger and better than ever before. We're very excited. We also have outdoor pursuit trips. So we're in Durango, Colorado, so we're surrounded by the San Juan National Forest. So we have mountains, rivers, all in your backyard. So we take our students on these adventure trips, whether it's backpacking, hiking, biking, skiing, kayaking, and it's from beginner level all the way to expert level. So we have scholarship opportunities for our students to take advantage of those areas. 
We also have a speaker series. So we take prominent members within the community and they come and visit Fort Lewis and our students are able to have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with them, village gatherings. And lastly, we do have an indigenous training as well. It's usually in August and it's just a way for our students to really captivate their leadership skills, problem solving skills, critical thinking skills as well. Basically all those skills you will need once you graduate from college and either go to grad school or go into the quote unquote real world, right? And so again, lots of activities and programs that our students can be a part of. Now next, we're gonna chat a little bit about the student organizations we have at Fort Lewis. So as I said, that transition, it can be a little difficult sometimes. It can be a little daunting. So I always recommend that students get involved on campus whenever they're coming to Fort Lewis for the first time. These are all of our different Native American um, registered student organizations that our students can be a part of. As you can see, there's ones for business, engineering, we have Diné Club, Native American Outdoor Club, Blue Alliance, one for our Society of Chicanos and Native American Science, one to Leota. So we have a ton of different areas that students can get involved in. And also at Fort Lewis College, because we're such a small community, a lot of our students are able to get leadership opportunities within these organizations as well. So as a sophomore, the beginning of your sophomore year, you potentially in the Diné Club, or you could be the, the secretary of our American Indian Business Leaders Club. You don't necessarily have to be a senior to get those leadership opportunities. So a lot of ways that you can get involved. Now, next on the slide, I believe we're gonna talk a little bit about the Native American tuition waiver and how that works. So at Fort Lewis College, as it is said on the slide, as a member, recognized Native American tribe or Alaska Native Village, a student may use the American tuition waiver to attend Fort Lewis College tuition free. So that will waive the entire tuition portion. Now students are still going to be responsible for room and board or your student fees as well, but that big chunk of tuition will be completely waived and it never expires. And also the tuition waiver does apply to our grad level program. So our teacher education program, it does apply to that as well. Now to qualify a student just needs to send. There's various ways that a student can qualify and it's listed right here. So a student can either submit a copy of their CIB or certificate of any blood. They can submit a copy of their tribal enrollment card or on our website we do have a, a short little page where a student can submit documentation of just a direct descendant of a tribal member who on June 1, 1934 resided within the present boundaries of the Native American reservation. So a few ways that students can qualify for the Native American tuition waiver. If you have any questions, whether you are a student, an educator, or a parent, if you have any more questions about that, again, all my contact information is going to be on that last slide, so feel free to shoot me an email. We always recommend, I think, um, Kimberly touched on this, FAFSA. But highly, highly recommended. So that free application for federal student aid. Um, if you are looking at coming for fall 2020 and you haven't applied yet, please apply for FAFSA. Uh, if you're looking at coming for fall 2021, that application opens on October 1st. So that's a really good way to see if you qualify for any financial aid assistance. Additional scholarships that are housed through Fort Lewis are going to be on the program that you're. You're interested in, there are some scholarships available. Being athletics at a varsity level. And then I always recommend outside scholarships as well. So any tribal scholarships. I always like to recommend fastweb.com for some of you students. I'm sure your counselors um, or the educators in the room are nodding their head like, oh yeah, we've recommended that. So fastweb.com is also another great website. And then as I mentioned, the Native American Center has scholarships as well available. So a lot of ways you can save while still attending um, college. Now this last slide I believe is going to be my contact page. And this is how you can get in contact with us. So we always recommend, as I said, we're hop, skip, and a jump away from you guys. So if you want to come and visit our campus, we would love to have you visit. Right now, the campus is currently closed. However, on fortlewis.edu slash visit, we'll have updated information of where our campus is going to be open. And then in the fall time, we would love to have any educators, any group tours, or any high school students come and visit our campus as well. We do have some virtual options if you want to hop on there. 
whenever you're ready and look at our virtual options as well. Now, as I said, my name is Alexa, so I'm the admission counselor for Arizona. So if you're a student and you have questions, feel free to email me or call me. If you're an educator and you want me to come visit your high school or your community college campus, feel free to let me know as well. I would be happy to come and visit if I can. Um, and then also I've provided the information for our director of diversity collaborative, Lee Bitsui. He's an amazing, incredible human being, and he's also here to kind of help filter any questions you might have about um, our diversity collaborative, any questions about the Native American Center or Fort Lewis in general. So feel free to screenshot that information and let me know if you have questions. Thank you so much. And thank you for your patience, guys, why I figure out technology, because it can be hard sometimes. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> uh -huh. thank you, Alexa. So now we are going to move on to the question and answer portion. So if you would like to use the chat box or unmute your line to ask a question, uh, that's uh, for sure inviting. And then also, I did see a question already for uh, the Dartmouth College. And then someone asked, does Dartmouth offer graduate programs? Yeah, thanks. And um, I did type a quick response in there as well. But um, Dartmouth does offer some graduate programs. As I mentioned, we're uh, principally an undergraduate organization and the college itself is uh, fairly contained, certainly in terms of the faculty and resources. But um, our oldest graduate program is the Geisel School of Medicine. So um, we have a full med school. We also have an engineering school and the Tuck School of Business. Those have been our three major historic graduate programs. And then the Garani School of Arts and Sciences is one that was uh, born about three or four years ago. So there are some masters and PhD options um, in arts and sciences programs as well. Uh, it is important to know that the 100% need-based financial aid that I talked about uh, for the college that is just for undergraduates. Um, each of the graduate programs does have their own financial aid offered, but each one is structured differently. So that financial aid policy um, just applies to the college itself. But um, I'd be happy to put folks in touch with uh, people at the graduate uh, programs. I work specifically with undergraduate admissions, but we do have those, those graduate programs available, so. Great, thank you, Stephen. Oh, okay, so I did have one question too, Stephen, uh, for the uh, admissions for under the recommendations. Uh, I saw that you said one peer recommendation. Uh, what does that usually mm -hmm. look like? And then sort of who would you recommend for like that peer recommendation? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so the peer recommendation is something that's a little bit unique uh, to Dartmouth. I don't know too many other um, schools or scholarships or anything that ask for it, but it's a lot of fun for us to read as admissions officers. Um, it gives us a little bit more of kind of a lateral insight into you as a person than just your teachers and counselors and kind of that top down sort of thing. So uh, it is actually absolutely wide open to you, whoever you would like to write that letter for you. Uh, it can be your next door neighbor, it can be your cousin, it can be your grandma's neighbor, it can be a coworker, it can be classmate, teammate, um, whoever you'd like to, to write for you. There's no real rules on it. We do try to recommend that students stick within about three or four years of their own age, simply because if it's too much older, oftentimes it's not really that peer perspective. So folks will often ask about like a coach or um, you know an elder or something like that. And those are great recommendations to have, and those can always be submitted as supplemental um, act, um, recommendations. But in terms of the uh, peer rec itself, usually three to four years, and then too much younger than three to four years. You know, we know your three-year-old sister would do an adorable recommendation, but the crayon is really hard to read in the computer. So, um, but uh, but it is wide open to anybody that that they would like. So. General rule of thumb, I always like to mention with recommendations, because it was certainly something I didn't understand when I was applying to college, is it's really best when it comes from someone who knows you well. So that applies to teachers and stuff too. A lot of times people just think they should go to the person who gave them the best grade or, you know, whatever. Um, but really those recommendation letters matter only to us in what they tell us about you as a person and as a student. So uh, getting people who, who know you well is really the best way to go. 
So, Jerry, would you have one question in the chat box? Um, in what ways are the local tribes involved with the Fort Lewis College, and do students have access to internship opportunities with the local Ute and other tribal nations nearby? Great question. Yes, absolutely. So, the local tribes in our area, so the Southern Ute Tribe is going to be the closest local tribe to our area. And as I said, we have something called village gatherings. And so we have gatherings, usually it's once a month with our local community. And so students and locals are able to mingle at our Native American Center. There's usually food involved because everyone loves food. And it's just a way for our community members to be involved with Fort Lewis. And we absolutely have internships with our local community as well, um, whether it's within the government or we have a lot of nonprofits as well locally locally um within our southern Ute tribe which is our local tribe here close to durango colorado so there is quite a few ways for our students to get involved as well um, within the four corners region great question One more question, Alexa. Um, in what ways are tribal colleges also involved with the Fort Lewis College? So the closest way that the tribal colleges are involved with us, we have a lot of our students um, that will come to Fort Lewis College after they get their associates or they might transfer to Fort Lewis. So we do a lot of outreach for our students um, that go to the local tribal scholarships. We have a specific transfer admission counselor who will go to those local those local areas. Also myself, I'm kind of an outreach coordinator as well for our Arizona community. So I'll go to a lot of the community events as well. And we try really hard to try and connect with our local tribal um, scholarships, as, excuse me, scholarship um, colleges as well. If that was a question from one of the local tribal scholarships and you would like Fort Lewis to come visit and we haven't visited in the past, feel free to let me know. We would love to come and visit, as I said, for a lot of the ones in the Four Corners region, we're only about a four to five hour drive away, which is not that far. So we'd love to come and visit with you, with you all as well. And we also have a lot of those students that come for group tours as well with the tribal colleges. Okay. Um, just going off of that question, Alexa, um, they're asking if you can provide an example of the internships that the past or current students have been involved with. Um, yes. Absolutely. So specifically with our internships with the local community. So within the Southern Ute tribe, um, we've had some students who are interested in criminology and justice studies. And so they'll do, they did a local um, internship with our community, which is in Ignacio, which is about 30 minutes away. And that's where the local government is housed. And so we had students for a semester who are able to intern with that local community get some real time experience. They actually got college credit for it as well. And it's able to transfer over to their college degree plan. We always tell students that it's so important to try and have a internship opportunity while you're still in college, because as we all know, as all the adults in the room, students, you're still adults, I promise. But as they all the grown ups in the room, that once you graduate, a lot of those a lot of those uh, careers ask for two to three years of experience and you in your mind as a student are like I've been in college for the last you know four years how am I supposed to have all that experience and so that's why we think it's really important to have those internships and that's why we provide those internships to our students as well and for that for, for that individual who asked that question if you want a list of a few other internships um, opportunities that we've provided for our students let me know I'm welcome to send you a list of um, a few more internship opportunities as well And then one more question, Alexa. Um, are there student representatives still available on the um, Native American Indigenous Studies Program committees or, or not? Are there still students, can you clarify, are there still students available? Can you clarify yeah. that for me? Yeah. 
Um, are there still student representatives um, that serve on the program committee? For the Native American Indigenous Studies program? Yes. So I, if I believe where this question is going, we do have, um, we have students within our student registered organizations that are also a part of the Native American Indigenous Studies program. We don't specifically have representatives within the program, and I might be getting this question wrong. So if I am, shoot me an email and we can clarify one on one. Um, but as I said, those student registered organizations, they switch um, every year. So depending on if a student wants to add another student organization, so maybe in the past there has been one. That list that I showed you was for this past year. So there could quite as well have been two years ago a different organization as well. I think that's kind of where the question is going. If you need me to clarify, as I said, feel free to shoot me an email for sure and we can clarify that question. Thanks. Stephen, do you want to comment on um, internships that are that may be available for the students at Dartmouth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so internships are very popular. Again, it's a, a nice aspect of the Dartmouth plan, that quarter system, because students can actually take advantage of doing internships pretty much at any point during the year if they want to take an off term to, to do something like that. So. Uh, you know, they don't necessarily just have to do internships during the summertime when uh, a lot of those internship programs can get pretty competitive, uh, the better, you know, more established ones. So about 75% or so of our students will end up doing uh, at least one formal internship before they graduate as, um, as an undergraduate. And they can be all over. So sometimes people will choose something a little bit closer to home uh, here in northern New England. Sometimes people will choose something in Boston. Majority students will pick things in either other major urban areas or something back home as well. So there's uh, all kinds of recruiters who come to campus for some of the you know more prestigious types of internships. But I think some of the really rewarding ones are the ones that the students also set up themselves. And so there is a lot of there are a lot of people here uh, between the Native American program, uh, Native American studies faculty, folks who and our career services center, uh, the Office of Professional Development. Uh, that work with the students one on one to help them establish those contacts uh, to set something up because I think sometimes internships aren't necessarily things that the average you know 17 18 year old knows about coming into coming into college. And one of the things I really love about our myth just in terms of facilitating student experiences and trying to make sure that money isn't an obstacle is they actually do have a grant set up so that. If you have an internship, but it's unpaid, and most of us like to, you know, eat and have some place to live and stuff like that while you're um, working, so uh, they actually have grants up to thirty-five hundred dollars for a term available to students. So if you get an internship that's unpaid, um, basically Dartmouth will give you the money to to pay your rent and your food and expenses and stuff to to be someplace else to get that experience. So that really helps uh, to open up a lot of doors for our students. Okay, one more question. This is for both. Um, what challenges from both institutions regarding regarding housing protocols in regards to Native needs and smudging or other ceremonies that Native students confront during the semesters? Is there an understanding of those needs from housing and RAs? Either or can answer. Or they're actually actually asking from both. Sure, I can, I can start. Um, so we actually, it's a great question and it's one that comes up uh, certainly for our students every year. Uh, here in the Native American house, it's usually pretty pretty straightforward. Um, our, the facilities oversight for the house has basically said anyone who wants to smudge personally in their rooms can do so. Um, the smoke detectors and sprinkler systems are set specifically so that, you know, an individual smudging would not be enough smoke to uh, cause any problems in that way. So that's sort of an unofficial policy. We also do have a formal protocol. So if a student um, wishes to smudge in their room anywhere on campus, regardless of where they're housed, they can submit a form to uh, facilities uh, at the beginning of the term, and they'll make sure that the settings are set so that it won't create any problems for students to be able to do that. 
Uh, generally speaking, if we've had anything larger, like when we have our big Indigenous Peoples Day gathering or a feast or anything where there might be, um, you know, concerns about a large number of people uh, using sage or sweetgrass or cedar or anything like that, uh, generally all we have to do is just let our facilities rep know uh, the day beforehand and they can come in and actually shut down the sprinkler system during that time. Uh, to make sure it doesn't interfere with anything but uh that was a, a battle we fought quite a few years ago and and fortunately we're able to get that as a result and um, it's been pretty smooth for our students uh, since then awesome yes i'll talk to fort lewis's policy it's pretty close to um what steven mentioned so for fort lewis because um we're a non-tribal Native American serving institution, we really do emphasize the cultural needs of our students. And so very similar to with smudging, as long as our students are just telling our RAs ahead of time and telling their roommates ahead of time, there, um, there really haven't been any issues. And it's similar, it's very, we have very similar policies. I love it. Um, with the um, fire, with the alarm system as well, it's not gonna go off for just smudging of any kind. Um, and very similar whenever we have a large gathering as well. Um, we work really closely with our facilities manager and it's never really been an issue um, if students need to smudge in other places as well as long as they just let um, our facilities managers know. So it's pretty open. Um, we definitely understand the cultural needs of our students. So we try to be flexible and adaptable with them. Oh, um, Alexa, I just thought of something. I think it was maybe four or five years ago. I think it was with like the local or the state government in Colorado where they were talking about, um, um, I guess it was a discussion of whether the, the tuition waiver uh, should actually be continued. Is that still sort of uh, discussed in uh, your state or local uh government or is that like firmly like um like uh, a solid uh you know documentation that will stay uh, for native students in colorado great question great question um we it's a firm are the st the government of colorado um they fund the native american tuition waiver there's no plans on that expiring or going away at any form as long as a student as i said on that slide qualifies, they will receive the Native American tuition waiver. Um, but thank you for qualifying, uh, clarifying that, Jerry. Okay, and just for both for clarification on um, the question about the smudging, does that also stand for um, if you use mountain tobacco uh, for uh, ceremonial purposes or uh, just sincere personal prayers during that time? Uh, yeah, again, I think it would, uh, great, great question. And I think it falls um, f more or less under the same protocols. Uh, we have had at least one student that's requested that. And again, as long as um, we just get the, get the request from the student, particularly if it's anything that will generate more than a little bit of, you know, um, smoke just to make sure that it's not going to create any problems with facilities. But uh, they've been, you know, uh, really quite open to pretty much whatever those needs have been, which has been been good to see. We always do a 24 hour fire during Indigenous Peoples Day um, here at the house, too. So we we're actually able, able to dig a fire pit in the, the backyard of the house. Um, we've had all kinds of you know different events uh, on campus to um, and we also have the use of the or, our organic farm uh, just north of campus. So when the Hawaiian students wanted to do a traditional pig roast, we were actually able to do that um, up there with the farm's blessing and help. And so um, th those kinds of things have always been, been able to be accommodated for us. I believe our policy is similar, but I'll be honest, I'm not quite sure with the tobacco smoke. So what I can do is get your contact information. I'll, I'll touch base with our student housing and facility services just to make sure I'm giving you that right information. So I'll make sure it, um, to get the contact information for that person who's asking those awesome questions. Thanks. And <laughs> this is for both. Um, there have been issues of housing and food insecurities and how have those been addressed among the native student population? Uh, 
Um, so as far as I, I can, I'll answer that, I guess, in, in two different directions. I'm not sure if it is current is a question regarding the current uh, situation with the COVID quarantine or just in, in general, because uh, uh, I think it can apply to either. Uh, so, first of all, it, as a general rule for our students, because we are a residential campus, um, again, the housing is guaranteed as part of the cost of attendance for students. So, um, if they uh, basically, as long as they're enrolled, they get their housing automatically, get, they get their meal plan. Um, we also always have backup through the Native American program. If somebody, you know, runs out of meal swipes uh, towards the end of the term, we've always been able to make accommodations for them. Uh, we always have groceries here um, at the Native American house. It's something that all the students have access to. So if they need to come in and make a meal for themselves or things like that, uh, that's you know generally something that we can take up care of uh, quite easily. Uh, in terms of if uh, regarding the, the current COVID-19 situation, uh, we did have several students after the campus moved to a virtual uh, teaching only. We did still have several students that, as you can imagine, Either uh, some of our students had literally no access to internet at home, so wouldn't be able to pursue their studies at all if they tried to go home. Uh, some students literally don't have homes to go back to, uh, things like that. So we were able to accommodate about 200 uh, students on campus, uh, making sure that they were sort of you know, appropriately distanced. They're still being served through the dining hall. It's all been takeout food that's been prepared specifically uh, for students to just come in and pick it, you know, pick it up for their, their three meals a day. Uh, but a few of our native students are still are still here on campus because of you know situations with families or um, housing concerns back home. So that's been something we've been able to take care of for for anybody who is uh, who needed to stay here. For Fort Lewis, we also um, do have residential housing for all of our students. So similar to Dartmouth, um, a student is guaranteed a place on our campus. Um, as well as with um, with food, if a student um, is you know has used up all of their swipes or might not have enough funding to fill their swipes again, we do have temporary grants and money that's laid aside for students. And then in our Native American Center, it's always stocked with um, brown bag lunch, extra groceries, and food for students as well. And then um, I believe I guess. And then in terms of for students who, I think I might've cut out. Oh, you're good. I think I was like, I think I cut out a little bit because everything went frozen. Um, let me just to circle back. So for students who, in terms of everything that's happened with COVID-19, we just, we still do have a few students that are on campus that were not able to go home or had no access to um, going home. And we have some temporary um, brown bag lunches for those specific students, but the majority of our students, um, thankfully, were able to go back home after um, all of our classes went online for the spring semester. And um, they were just asking if there were tribal foods um, or traditional foods that were served in the cafeteria, or is that just at the Native American centers, or is it just that they bring it from home? Oh, yeah. Uh, for so, Dartmouth, it's, oh, yeah, like, go for yeah, it. Okay, yeah. Steven, you're good. Yeah. Uh, for Dartmouth, it's a little bit of all of the above. Uh, we um, majority of stuff that people will cook is just stuff that they want to cook uh, for them, you know, for themselves from home. Uh, we do actually have a really proactive dining services program, though. So during Indigenous Peoples Day, they actually contacted us and wanted to prepare um, foods that were more locally Indigenous. So they actually worked with. Some tribal members from local communities to prepare a whole weekend menu um, of some traditional foods and things like that. Uh, we actually have a lot of our students are interested in food security and food sovereignty issues. So uh, last May we actually had a, a food sovereignty conference. So uh, the sous chef actually came out and did a meal for about 100 students on campus as a special event talking about traditional foods and diet and things like that as part of that event as well as representatives from different Tribal nations talking about some of their food security and, and sovereignty programs, um, but then the stuff that happens here in the house is usually uh, stuff that the students themselves want to do, and we're usually able to find either through housing or the Native American program, and or one of the student organizations will find the funding for that. Usually, um, for students, the majority of for tribal foods in general, usually they'll just either cook it in the our cultural kitchen or bring it from home. But we do during. Native American Heritage Month, um, we do set aside a few dates and have specific old tribal foods within our San Juan dining hall. 
And then similar on Indigenous Peoples Day, we do um, specific foods during that day as well. So definitely um, a few opportunities for not for students of our whole population involved in the Native American Center to be able to connect with um, the different cultures and communities. Then I think we, Jerry, do we have time for two more questions? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. Um, the first of two is what support systems are available for the LGBT, LGBTQ relatives on campus for both um, Native specifically, but overall good to know for um, in the communities? Lexi, do you want to go first this time? Yep. Yes, I'll go first. Um, so for Fort Lewis College, we do have um, our own center. We call it the G, but we do have a center for our, um, for our LGBTQ community. So similar to how we have a Native American center, we have a center for our students who would like to be a part of that. And we have an ally center as well. We don't have a separate club per se just for our uh, students of Native Amer that identify as Native American or Alaska Native, an LGBT LGBTQ community for them. It's all encompassed with energy center, but we also have programs and trainings. Um, we do an awesome drag show during February and during um, pride month, usually not this month, but in general, usually have a great celebration. So there's a lot of programs and resources for our students. We also do gender inclusive housing as well at Fort Lewis college. So essentially um, we don't ask what gender you identify as. So if you want to live on campus, um, you can definitely select gender inclusive housing students can as well. Similar, um, similar with Dartmouth, the uh, there's a number of strong resources here. We have a program called OPAL, the Office of Pluralism and Leadership, that works with a number of um, LGBT and um, queer organizations, student organizations across campus. As a specific advisor, who helps uh, you know in planning events campus wide. Uh, we have a another living and learning community called the Triangle House, which is specifically uh, dedicated to LGBTQ issues. And we do actually have a um, group on campus called Indigiqueer, which is a um, growing Native student organization, part of the overall Native student organization pantheon that we have that is, is looking at queer issues within the, within the Native community, so. And then, um, I'll go back up. Will there be a possibility to have part-time enrollment opportunity in the fall for online courses due to the COVID-19 uncertainty? They don't have anything for the yeah. I'll go, I'll, I can go first. Um, so for now, for Fort Lewis College, we are actively planning on having all of our classes on campus, traditional on-campus learning. We are at the whim of our governor and of the government and of how this virus is going to evolve. So we have an incredible leadership team and our president that's on top of everything that's going on in the world. And obviously our students are our number one priority and their safety and also our faculty and staff. Um, and as the situation evolves, we'll be in close communication with anyone involved at Fort Lewis College if students or faculty are looking at coming. But for now, um, Fort Lewis College is actively planning on having all of our traditional on-campus classes. Yeah. Similar here, uh, you know, we still have not made an announcement yet about what fall is going to be. So we're waiting to, you know, I think they're trying to wait as long as possible to determine what the safety level is going to be for students returning to campus and being back in residential mode. But that's certainly the hope. Uh, if they're right now, um, basically, one thing a little bit unique to Dartmouth is because of the quarter system and because of the condensed nature of the terms, uh, three classes is a full time load for us. That's our recommended load for students because the faculty do condense about the same amount of information into a, a 10 or 11 week quarter that is usually in a 14 to 16 week semester. So they're fairly intense, um, but students can take as many as four or as few as two classes and still be considered a full time student. So students would still have the same uh, opportunity to do that if it was a virtual uh, programming as well. But um, but we're still waiting to hear what what the fall will look like. But right now, all plans are to you know open as we you know, would normally in the fall. Okay, I think those are the last of the questions. Um, yes. 
Oh, just, uh, I think the final one was just how um, the student support services um, are able to bring together culture and academics. And then that's the final question. <laughs> Um, well, I think, you know, we talked a little bit about the academic advising and tutors and stuff, I think, for both schools, you know, available through the Native American program um, and are, I think, one of the advantages to having the Native Studies program and Native faculty here <clears throat> is really uh, comes in the nature of advising as well. So a lot of our faculty pull a lot of overtime advising students, our Native students who may not even be NAS majors or students, but really helping them find um, and draw those strong connections between, um, you know, the type of education back home and cultural values and um, their communities in, as well as their academics. So we've had some really amazing student projects that have been funded through Native, Native Studies too, uh, to really help, you know, students get involved with doing things with their communities um, and getting academic credit for that, getting those things funded. Uh, so there's really a, you know, huge, huge amount of support available for, you know, all aspects of academics and culture. And similar at Fort Lewis College, as I mentioned previously, we do have our tutoring that's housed in our Native American Center. Um, we also have professors um, that have their office hours within the Native American Center and also having Native faculty and staff. We have um, kind of a mentor program for those students as well that's housed in our Native American Center that I forgot to chat about. And so a lot of ways that our students are able to get involved um, with the speaker series, we have we have um, prominent figures from professors from other universities and we have authors and musicians that are coming onto our campus to kind of intertwine those at that academic and cultural aspect as um, as the question states as well. So there we really try really hard to intertwine both the culture and those academics at Fort Lewis similar. Okay, thank you. So if there aren't any other questions, we will just move on quickly. Um, so we do uh, have a list of college tuition waivers for Native American students. This is a PDF file. Um, if you would like uh, us to send this to you, uh, just uh, list your email inside the chat box and we'll be able to uh, take that request and we can send that to you through email. And lastly, um, quick updates. We do have our scholarship, student scholarship application open. You can either um, go to the ITCA website, or you can uh, also uh, ask me directly, uh, Jerry Thomas, for the uh, scholarship application, and I will send it to you. The deadline is Friday, July 17th, and then also we have our AIEA membership. Um, that can also be found on the website at www.itcaonline.com backslash AIEA. And then also we do have our uh, summer youth camp. Uh, this year it's gonna be on a virtual platform and it's gonna be planned uh, within July of this year. And then also we do have our second annual AIEA educators uh, banquet where we will be giving out uh, awards to nominated um, educators and teachers from around Arizona. That's going to be held at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center. Right now we have a tentative date of September 12th. Uh, last year we had the superintendent of Arizona join us for the uh, a keynote speaker position. So that was really nice. Those are the uh, pictures there for the camp participants and then also our educators banquet celebration there. And then lastly, uh, my name is Jerry Thomas and I'm the webinar the webinar organizer, and then the secretary for AIEA. Um, if you have any questions about AIEA, the webinar, the scholarship, any of our events coming up, uh, you can uh, email me at jerrythomas, uh, jerry.thomas at itcaonline.com, or you can call me on my cell phone at 480-452-4867. Sorry about that, 4867. And then also uh, we have Kimberly binkau Bigay as our AIEA president. Or if you would like to get in touch with our offices or would like to access or use our um, general email, uh, our 
email is at aiea.est2003 at gmail.com. And we thank you for, um, you know, um, we thank uh, first our uh, presenters for making time for us and then for um, joining us and helping us a lot with this um, presentation. We thank you for all your, you know, hard work and effort, you know, going into this presentation. And it was really exciting and it was really interesting to hear about all these opportunities. You know, a lot of our uh, Arizona uh, students uh, may not know about this. So we're really excited to get this uh, webinar out to show them uh, what sort of opportunities are out there, you know, outside the state of Arizona. So we're really thankful for you guys uh, being here. So, and uh, if there's uh, nothing else, let's see. And then I think that should be it. Great. Yes, thank you again, uh, Scott, Stephen, and Alexa for providing the presentation today. And thank you to all the participants uh, joining us today. We look forward to having our next one. So keep posted to our website and information that Jerry has mentioned. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you.